Well, good evening and welcome back. It's Sunday evening. We're going to be jumping into Titus chapter 3. So it'll be Sunday evening. This is recorded. You may hear it on another day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday of a whole different date. Who knows? But today is Sunday. It is uh, the September 29. All right. We already covered one and two. Let's get into three. In chapter three itself, chapter three addresses the behavior expected of believers, uh, the basis of their salvation, uh, and the importance of good biblical works. I always make sure I say that because people get that confused. Not works, biblical works in the uh, life of a Christian community. Paul emphasizes humility and the power of God's grace and the need for unity among believers. Why do I say unity? Because what is going on? Everybody is so divisive these days. They just, they're just they trying to be divisive. This is not tares in the wheat we're talking about. This is not separate. You know, separating them, not even on theological discussions, it is separating because of control, of power. Just men who are just, I don't know, uh, put themselves on a higher level, who want. And that's the other thing. Uh, if you want it, if that's all you want, then you shouldn't have it. You're not ready. Uh, lack of better phrasing. But let's read, um, we're going to read the first couple of verses here in Titus chapter 3. Uh, we'll read 1 and 2. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no man, be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. You know, three, two, to speak, uh, speak evil of no man. Some speak evil of Christians, don't they? Each other. And gossip. They gossip to others. My friends, brothers and sisters, that is evil. The gossip itself is evil. When you're behind people's back trying to say that someone said something and you don't have the courage, the biblical manhood to address those matters in a biblical way to that person in front of others to rectify those problems. You're young, and that's usually what it is. It's youngness or immaturity or uh, selfishness or a lot of things like that play into that. And that's that's just sad. But we can see in these verses 1 and 2 that Paul begins by instructing Titus to remind the people to be obedient to rulers and authorities and to be ready for every biblical good of work and to speak evil of no one, as I said before. But this calls, um, or I should say, this call to good conduct emphasizes the importance of Christians being responsible people or citizens in their area. Oh, no, you got to you know bow down to the government. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, they have to be responsible citizens, responsible people, responsible in, within their own communities, uh, especially Christian communities within the body of Christ, exemplifying the values uh, of humility and kindness. Um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the exhortation to be gentle and show humility towards all is crucial for maintaining a positive witness in the community. Some people don't like to go into the community. They want to go out there and hate only. There's a time to be aggressive and time not to be aggressive. If you can't discern between those two approaches, then again, you should not be in any form of ministry, in my opinion, as a leader. That's just my opinion. Um, you can disagree. That's okay. But Paul begins uh, here with a call for believers to demonstrate proper behavior in society. Paul instructs Christians. Now, this is, you know, this is where we get a little weird here because there there are two sides here. There's one way to way on one side and way on the other. You know, Paul instructs Christians to be subject to rulers and authorities. People get ex into this going, see, we have to follow government no matter what. And other people are like, no, we will never follow government. So we, again, we don't discern where, when, how, why, you know, a lot of different things go into this. Uh, this reflects a foundational principle in Christian ethics, 
being uh, subject to a rule and authorities. Now, there's times, but anyways, honoring governing bodies. There's a time to honor the governing bodies, I should say, as instituted by God in Romans chapter 13, I think the first seven verses, or seven or eight verses. Uh, the idea is to foster a peaceful coexistence. I use this word on purpose because people know that I do coexistence videos. Um, what that means is we have to live within the world around us. But it's for a time that we follow the rules, okay, of the government and stuff like that. There are times when we don't, but they have to be based on biblical uh, uh, foundation, and that's important. If anybody knows me, I am not a government guy. That is for darn sure. Oh, no, I said darn, and so somebody's going to call me out on saying that word darn. But uh, that is for certain. I, I am not a government guy. Uh, I don't speak about the government. I don't speak about the military or against any of them, and then I'm working for the government or the military or anything like that. No, that's not even close. Not happening. Uh, he emphasizes readiness for biblical good works, advocating for a life marked by kindness, gentleness, and respect. This demonstrates that Christian faith should manifest in practical actions. See, that's important. Practical actions. If you don't have the able... Some people try because they don't deal with the everyday life and they, they're trying... Uh, their best are like, well, this is how you practically apply it, but they don't know because they've never been in the situation. Again, there are men who are, are leaders of things, and they have not experienced, understood. They read a book, and, well, I heard other people, and they're not. It's it's unfortunately. And young men end up following young men in, in, into a bad place. And it's, and it's unfortunate because some young men are just dying for the truth and want to have discipleship and they're latching onto anything and they, 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 the the younger men younger than myself but for the majority anyways um they're tired of the elitism the the old stuffy crowd with the three-piece suits i'm not a three-piece suit guy either but they get they want well i want something young and fresh and we're concerned about that instead of the word of god that's huge all right let's go to um uh, verses 3, what are we going to do, 3 through 7? We'll do 3 through 7, yeah. Uh, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So we see here verses 3 through 7, Paul Paul contrasts the past lives of believers with their new identity in Christ, out of the old into the new. Paul lists attributes such as being foolish, disobedient, and enslaved to passions, which serves as a reminder of the radical change that can happen after salvation. This acknowledgement of human weakness sets the stage for the message of grace. We are saved by grace. The turning point is God's kindness and love, which leads to salvation. Paul emphasizes that salvation is not a result of human works. Remember, I talked about biblical works, not regular works, but rather an act of divine mercy highlighting the concept of grace. The imagery of the washing of regeneration speaks to the transformative experience of being born again. That All that means is just a change. I love transformative. I love that word. Just 
It's an absolute change of being born again. Now, some are going to be further along the path than others. You know, where some, some get saved and overnight they just drop everything. Others a little over time and some a lot at first and then a little after that. And people, there has to be growth. But the renewal of the, the, uh, the renewal by the Holy Spirit underscores the ongoing work of God in the believer's life, fostering spiritual growth and sanctification. In verse 3, Paul reflects on the past condition of humanity, highlighting traits such as foolishness, disobedience, and enslavement to various passions, which some can still be connected to. This candid acknowledgement serves as a reminder of the grace extended to believers and the need for compassion towards others who may still be in this state. That is a bad state of mind. In verses 4 through 5, which I would have to say, well, let's put it this way, the transition in verses 4 and 5 seem to underscore the core message of the gospel. Salvation is not earned by works, but is a result of God's mercy and grace. Not the guy down at the church down the street, not the online guy, not this guy. Paul emphasizes that it is through the kindness of love, or I should say the kindness and love, of God our Savior, that believers are saved, not being saved, reinforcing the idea that regeneration and renewal come from the Holy Spirit. This doctrine of grace is foundational to the Christian faith. In verse 6, Paul mentions that the Holy Spirit was poured out abundantly. Abundantly. Man, that's a lot. This highlights the active role of the Spirit in the believer's life, signifying a new beginning and empowerment for living a righteous life. And verse 7 assures believers of their inheritance of eternal life. This promise is central to Christian hope, reminding them of their identity as heirs of God's grace. Don't worry about what's going on in the world around you too much. You stay focused. The insurance of salvation, did I say insurance? The assurance of salvation motivates believers to pursue good works, good biblical works, as a response to God's love. Now let's read verses 8 through 11. And again, just a reminder, we are in the King James Bible. This is what I read from. Uh, best as far as I'm concerned. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. Many people do have uh, foolish questions, don't they? I love verse three ten. <laughs> so used for uh, some people in a good way, but others in a unfortunate way because uh, there are some people who can't handle the first and second. Then say they have the first and second. There, there are a lot of accusers out there who like to accuse each other. And I've talked about this before. I, I think it's unbiblical. All the accusations that people throwing at each other without giving it to the people and bringing it to everyone. Unbiblical, and they're in sin, they're in error, and it's unfortunate. 
So if you're following anyone like that, walk away, honestly. Just walk away, as far as I'm concerned. Because if they can't handle the admonition, but they can, they, but their desire is to only rebuke and uh, um, attack other people as heretics, then you need to run away. But in verses 8 and 11 that we were just talking about, Paul underscores the importance of good works. And I'll repeat it again. Biblical good works. As evidence of faith. Wait, you want evidence? Here we go again. Paul encourages Titus to affirm that good works are profitable for all. This reinforces the belief that genuine faith produces actual results in the believer's life, not because you want it to, but when you follow the Holy Spirit, not your own desire, not your own will, not how you want to look, but we follow how th there will be results. But the most important thing is, I don't even think you should notice the results. But the outside world, when they see it, they know. Paul advises caution regarding those who cause division. Oh, it happens more now than ever. Whether it be people online or people offline. I say that now because the internet wasn't a thing when I was a kid. But I'll tell you what, man. At least division then was in, a, in one building. Now it's divisions across all platforms now. Well, Paul advised against this. He advises being careful and watching out for these divisions, highlighting the necessity of church discipline. Yeah, I said church discipline. Oh, before church building, grow up, buddy. I'm not talking about a church building. You have to get out of that mindset of in a church building or out of church, but there has to be a body of Christ. There are people in a church. You got these, what, moderators, right? Moderators, on, 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 I'm not against moderators or anything, but they're performing a duty in a church system. You can put different words on whatever you want. It's still the same thing. It has to be a system. There has to be an organization, except for those who desire the need to be in charge and be a leader of th some things. Throughout history, I think the greatest leaders have been the ones who've been reluctant, except for, and so the ones who desire to be so to prove themselves or to feel validated. But when you have a church discipline in the proper biblical matter that serves to protect the community from false teachings and disruptions, emphasizing unity and sound doctrine. Now, if you ban people and you excommunicate people because you don't like what they say, you're an error, you're a false liar, and you're a sinner. That's all there is to it. I don't know why we're making excuses for that nowadays, but that's, the, that's where we're at. In verses 8 and 9, Paul stresses the importance of engaging in good works. Again, good biblical works. As these are profitable for all, he contrasts this with the futility. Did I say futility? The futility of engaging in foolish disputes. How many times do you see that, young men or young women? How many times do you see this? You see these, just these little tiny matters. Such foolishness that they blow up in this whole thing because they need 100% control. They're in sin. And if they don't change, boy, are their work going to burn up in that fire. They're not going to have much to show, are they? But he talks about the futility of this along with genealogies and strife. This reflects a call to focus on what truly matters. Faith in Action, rather than being sidetracked by divisive issues that divide people and pit them against one another. And whoever involves himself with that and allows that these days, sometimes at first you can see it and you're like, ah, something don't seem right and you're not sure what to do. But though, obviously those who create it are just absolutely in sin. And they need to repent. And others that follow along and just want to be part of that, you're in sin. Don't be involved in that. If someone says, you, you know what, what I think you, no, 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 don't get involved. Don't get involved. 
You know, I know you never heard of this person before, but did you know? Ah, 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 ah. Nope. Nope. Don't listen to that. Tell them to tell them to shut up. Tell them that's not biblical. And if they can't handle you telling them it's not biblical, then they themselves are in sin. Those are just facts. In verses 10 and 11, Paul gives practical advice on dealing with divisive people. He instructs Titus to reject a certain person or certain persons after a couple of admonitions. This shows the seriousness of maintaining unity within the church while also recognizing that some individuals may be resistant to correction, but be wary and be careful of creating an echo chamber of things you want to hear instead of relying on biblical scripturals, or scriptural, scriptural uh, uh, guidelines. All right, let's read uh, chapter 12, I'm sorry, verses 12 through 15. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, or Tychicus? Tychicus. Some of these names, I'll tell you. I'll, I don't think I'll ever get them right. Be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee, Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. It was written to Titus, ordained the first bishop of the Church of the Cretans from Nicopolis of Macedonia. Verses 12 and 15 here. This is the final verse, or I'm sorry, verses. Uh, Paul provides practical advice and, and personal remarks. Paul discusses sending Zenos and Apollos, demonstrating the collaborative nature of ministry. He encourages readiness to, to help fellow workers, emphasizing the proper communal aspect of the Christian faith, not communism. Paul ends with a reminder of the importance of love and grace among believers. If it doesn't exist, somebody is not a believer. His final greeting word I'm looking for, encapsulates the essence of Christian fellowship, grounded in mutual support and encouragement. Paul concludes the chapter uh, here with the, the personal instructions uh, of encouragement. He mentions, again, he mentions the plans to send either Artemis and uh, uh, Tychicus to Titus, um, highlighting the importance of the leadership and support in the church. Paul, like I said before, Paul also emphasizes the need to, uh, or need for believers to be diligent in good works and to meet urgent needs. This reiterates the call to live out their faith practically, not hidden, practically. Not, 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 not. I'm not going to this place or this place, and I won't meet these people, and I won't do this, and I won't do that. <sighs> we have to be in the world. We have to be out there every day. If you're hiding yourself from out there, then you're failing your job. You're failing. It's just that simple. It's amazing how people want to make the Bible so complicated. It's not not all of it. So I'll end this here is that Titus uh, uh, chapter 3 here serves as a powerful, a rather powerful reminder of the Christian's uh, uh, extreme change or transformation through grace and the resultant uh, or and the result uh, uh, call to live in a way that reflects that change. Paul's teachings underscore the importance of good works, community, and maintaining a focus on the gospel while navigating the complexities of life in a diverse society. A lot of people are avoiding that. This chapter in is the uh, is the essence of Christian living, responding to God's grace with lives marked by kindness, humility, and good deeds, biblical good deeds. 
But we're these are our lessons in the con- like I said before the the, the navigating the, the complexities of uh, of life, uh, everyday life. Uh, there are some people who hide from this and 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 don't want anything to do with this. And and, I, and I'm this is when I'll refer to pretty much. Uh, a majority of the self-proclaimed, uh, self-anointed people out there on the internet, and even in mega churches, but the internet uh, community, who who are not going to work, who don't have jobs, who don't do this. Listen, young man, if you don't have a job, then, then you fail God, and you're a loser. That's all there is to it. If you live with your mama, and you want to complain about your mama, you live with your daddy, you complain about your daddy, you live with this one, your aunt, your uncle, whatever it may be, and you complain about that, but you have yet to walk out the door and create a life, and you don't have faith enough to walk out the door and be a man and step up to the plate, then you have failed. Do not call yourself this born-again Christian believer unless you just changed, unless you just became one. But if you're a year in, two years in, three years old, and you're still complaining about these things, young man, stop complaining. Because you have seen nothing compared to what folks have seen out there. Young men, young Christians today, Will face persecution, yes. There's a lot of temptation that there's never been before. But you have not seen anything. Man, you are living a charmed life. You got the TV, you got internet, you got iPhones, you got Samsung, you got computers, you got GPS, you got everything going on under the sun. I'm not saying I don't have a computer or GPS. I'm not saying that at all. I have this. I'm on it right now. Get a job, stop complaining, okay? Work hard. And that's another sign that God God wants that. How blessed is, blessed is a man who goes to work every day, works his finger to the bone, works hard. Show, if you can't do the small things, just like get a job, then you can't handle the big things can't handle the small, you can't handle the big. All right, with that, I appreciate your time. I think we're closing about almost a half an hour, and I think it's almost supper time. All right, God bless. And if you're ever in Tennessee, I'll leave my email. You, you look me up. And if I can meet with you, I'll meet with you. God bless, and have a beautiful evening.